Hey everyone, uh, it's uh, Hoboken Talks. It's Thursday night, 7 o'clock, maybe 7.01, and we're here again with a great program. Uh, we're streaming live with either Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Uh, YouTube is probably our most popular platform, and if you're registered, you'll be able to make comments. You'll be live. We'll read them off, and uh, you can ask a question or give a shout-out. Uh, we have done... Rand tells us that we've done almost 90 episodes, which sounds like a lot. And it is weekly, and we continue that tradition. Uh, past shows have included interviews with Senator Bernard Kenny, Stu Cicciarella, Michael Turner, Paul Drexel, Frank Hanavin, Irene Sobolov. We, you know, we're talking to all of the heart of Hoboken, and tonight is no exception. So I'm really happy that our guest, uh, Barbara Moriello, is here. And uh, again, the show is Hoboken Talks. We are live. And Barbara, welcome to the show. Here we are. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Happy to be here. Oh, talking to yeah. You. We scheduled this, and we, you were gracious. You let us postpone it a few mm -hmm, times, mm -hmm. but we're here now, uh -huh. and yeah. we're going to have a nice conversation. Yes. Um, I always refer to what's going on in the background when we mm -hmm. have a picture, mm -hmm. and it looks like we're, this is like an evil machine. What are no. we looking at? You're looking at my baby. It's my beautiful board cutter, and you are. That's the heart of the bindery, and um, yes, you're looking at a couple of presses, my storage unit, and my 125-year-old paper cutter made in Worcester, Massachusetts. Wow. And um, it's it is the heart of the bindery. Sure. Yeah. So I can. I was saying before, I can almost hear that swoosh. Yes. I mean that arm's got weight. Yeah. And uh, yes, it has a hundred pound balance on the end of the knife. So that's what you need to make a good crisp cut right. through a board or paper. So I hope yes. you turn off the cell phone when you're cutting <laughs> and uh, just focus yeah. and. Yeah. Eyes on the blade? I, yes, yes. It's, it's very safe. It's not an electric machine. You know, the guillotines that replace this are a little more dangerous, but this is a hand tool. This I regard as one of my many and my most favorite hand tool. Right. Mm -hmm. How much do you think it weighs? A, a couple of I, uh, 600 pounds maybe. There is a ca it's a steel tabletop, an iron ca counterbalance it can't be shoved around so um it's there yeah it's there so it's sort of i regard it as my piano that many people have in their homes not too many people have a board cutter in their home sure but i'm very proud gotcha. of gotcha yeah so we probably sh i should have put it in oh. context first uh your profession is i am a bookbinder a book artist a teacher and I have been for 40 years, wow. a combination of those. That's yes. pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And um, so tell me about, do you, here's Alexander Rosario III, who has also <laughs> been on the show. And can he cut Benny slices of pizza? I'm sure <laughs> it can, but oh, the cleanup. The yeah. cleanup. <laughs> There's no, this, this uh, guillotine is not going to no, cut pizza. No, no, no. <laughs> right. That, that was pretty good. I, yes. I didn't really think Expect about <laughs> uh, culinary arts no. uh, in this, whatever. Mm -hmm. good, to, good to hear from mm -hmm. you, uh, Rosario. Um, and uh, there's another piece of equipment that's sort of behind you. Yeah, at my head yes. is a table press, a letter press, uh, a much smaller piece of equipment, and that's for gentle, slow, or heavy pressure on objects that are drying. So that is a more commonly available tool. That one someone found in a barn. I mean, where do you get your equipment when it's 100 years old? It has to come from a barn. <laughs> <laughs> or someone's you know, out in the garbage on, on the sidewalk. Or in my case, the cutter from a, a leather factory in the garment district, because the tool that we use is, was used for leather bags, belts, et cetera. Um, yeah. But you still have to get it to Hoboken. Yes, you do. It's it not like you go, oh, I found it. No, it comes to pieces, yes. Right, mm -hmm. yeah, wow. Yeah. And so uh, tell me a little bit about uh, growing up in Hudson uh -huh. County. Mm -hmm. Well, I was born and grew up in Jersey City. My mother was born in Jersey City. My father, uh, after medical school, did his internship in Jersey City and stayed on at the Jersey City Medical Center. So... Um, our whole life, you know, half of my life was in Jersey City, and 
I loved it. I loved many parts of it, and um, uh, that sense of my neighborhood, my friends, the area I lived, which I'll, I'll show you some photos later of the playground, which was basically that massive statue of Abraham Lincoln in the park. And um, yes, it was a very exciting. I loved being in a city where I could be, even as a 10-year-old or an 11-year-old, independent. We would walk up to Journal Square on Saturdays to go to one of the four movie palaces. Do you remember the names oh, of sure. the theaters? The State, Lowe's, the Stanley. And then there was a lesser one that showed older movies called The Picks. And it wasn't I, as I elegant. never heard of the picks. That was a little. That was the outcast movie theater. Okay. It didn't have the elegance of the other three. But yeah, we'd march up the boulevard and go to any movie at any time. We never even went necessarily at the beginning. It was just we'd walk in, we'd watch it, and when we got to that part in the next showing, we would leave. You know, and then having seen the whole thing, but in two different time slots. I mean, but we did it on our own. We could, sure. you know, just walk in. Yeah, people theater. don't realize how important movie theaters were oh. in the up until 60s and 70s, yes, but they yeah. go back, you know, to yeah. the 20s and 30s. Yeah. They were these, you know, Moroccan or Egyptian palaces, and that is something that I remembered and knew as a child was very special. Sure. And so of those theaters, what would be the grandest, do you think? Um, probably the Stanley, which is the Talk about the Stanley now. What is it? It's a Jehovah's Witness That's Center. That's right. Yeah. 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 But I even have more affection for that. I'm going to make an admission that I have hardly ever made in my life. But as a kid, I played the accordion, and the music school was on top of the Stanley Theater. Really? Yeah. So I went to the Stanley every week to go upstairs to, to the music school. But anyhow, none of that. No, no more discussion of that. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> and, yeah. um, you know... The Stanley now is a house of worship, mm -hmm. and I think you can go and get a tour there. Yes, which, I think so. Yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah. I always like to reference that the orchestra pit is now the baptismal pit, wow. and huh. they changed all the uh, allegorical paintings and made them more in line with Jehovah Witnesses, oh, really? uh -huh. but it still has that incredible ceiling uh -huh. with the stars, uh -huh. right? The uh -huh. constellations yeah, yeah, and so on. That's fabulous. And uh, the Lowe's across the street. It's been refurbished. It, yeah, I think it's yeah. in kind of in refurbishing mm. mode uh -huh. now, and luckily is still with us, uh -huh. and will I think will become, it had been a place to see vintage films, uh -huh. which was really special, uh -huh. and they restored their organ. Uh -huh. Uh, but they're going to make it into kind of concert venues mm -hmm. uh, also. Mm -hmm. But the other two you mentioned gone. are gone, yes. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But two out of four, not, not bad, too bad. Right? Yeah. yeah, Hoboken used to have a lot of theaters, uh, and we actually don't have any. I know. Yeah, which is yeah. kind of sad. It but is. Jersey City. Um, so would you go alone? Would you go if you're, you come from a large family? Well, I didn't hang out with my siblings. I mean, the point was... <laughs> <laughs> to leave them behind. Of course. And so it would be friends walking up the boulevard. Okay. Yeah. But mm -hmm. your parents would say, go by yourselves, right? Yeah. I remember occasionally a neighbor's, the mother of one of these friends would call a cab if it were a rainy Saturday, and just we'd all pile into a cab, and she'd say, take them to Journal Square, and then we'd get out and go to whichever movie. Right, <laughs> you know, right. Again, whenever we got there. So parents probably would not do this now. No, I doubt you know, it. Yeah. It's not whatever. Yeah, yeah. And then the Lowe's was, I'm not sure when it ended, you know, before it got yeah. taken over by the nonprofit mm -hmm. and they started, mm -hmm. you know, showing older mm -hmm. films. Mm -hmm. But it, I think it was operating till the mid 80s. I don't know. Uh, as a theater. Yeah. And it was kind of a funky place to go see a film uh -huh. uh, in the 80s. No. But, but in the yeah. 60s and yes. 70s. Yeah. 50s, 60s. And you had those big lobbies and yes. that sense mm -hmm. of uh, escaping, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, yeah. yeah, they were cool. wonderful. Cool. Yeah. So are you the oldest in the family? No. Or? I have um, two sisters, an older sister, a younger sister, and three younger brothers. Gotcha. And um, so, yes, it was um, a large family lively growing up yeah uh -huh. we we might as well go to yeah, some of the pictures because they do the kind of illustrate mm -hmm. irene corman sobolov also a guest oh the pics yeah. the pics forgot yeah. about that one yeah. yeah i have to look it yeah, up yeah. yeah thank you irene mm -hmm. um and so, so 
well this is a picture this is my father he's in the center smiling holding a book and i'd love to know what book he's reading <laughs> after he got out of when he was in medical school it was during the later years of world war ii and the army was paying for their medical schooling and it was an expedited education. They had no summer vacations to get them ready to go participate in the war. Gotcha. So, so um, he's a medic in World War II. Well, the war ended pretty much when he ended okay. his medical so training. Okay, so timing is he everything. he got sent to Texas for something, and that's what he's doing there. And then um, when the Korean War started, he was called up. Ah. At that point, he was a, an internist and an infectious disease doctor, and so he was sent to Fort Dix, which was good. Right, because but it's like 10 years later. It, it, you know. it was in the 50, yeah, right. in 53 or 4 or something, sure. yes. Mm -hmm. Is he married at that point? He or? was married, and he had three children, and he had just bought the house where we all grew up. But before buying the house, he went to Washington to make sure his service had been completed and he would not be called up, and they assured him that was true. So he came back up, he bought the house, he set up his office, and then he got shipped to Fort Dix, so a friend of his rented the office, and um, and my father would come back on Wednesdays and Saturdays to office hours and to visit with the family. Wow! <laughs> so wow. my mother had three little girls. Yeah, she in must the house. have been. Uh, yes, it was. She was working busy. hard. She was yeah, busy. Yeah, definitely, mm -hmm. definitely. Yes. Cool. Uh huh. And then. Uh, there he is later in life. Of course, sure. he was a teacher um, at New Jersey College of Medicine and Dentistry. And he was um, chief of medicine at the Jersey City Medical Center, where he spent his life. And he also rotated to other Christ sure. Hospital and other. So is the is it called Mary Haig Hospital at that point? It was or? called the Margaret Haig was one unit of the medical center, Got it. named after Haig's mother. It was the maternity hospital. Right. It's called the Margaret Haig. Right, yeah. which you know goes back to Mayor Haig. Yes. And I think the one of the benefits was if you. Uh, you know, if you delivered, if you were having a baby, the baby's delivered, you never got a bill. Is that true? Yeah, in the early years. Oh. I don't know. Uh -huh. Haig is like 1930 yes. to 47. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary is his mother. Uh -huh. And so it's named after uh -huh. Mayor Haig's uh -huh. mother. But uh -huh. I'm pretty sure that's yeah. true. But I'm yeah. not sure when it ended, yeah. you know, huh. on there. So yeah. Mayor mm -hmm. Haig was mm -hmm. like, you know, uh -huh. everyone said good things mm -hmm. pretty much uh -huh. if they had a baby. Yes, it yes. was a huge maternity hospital for yes. in right. the area. Sure, and, um, and it's now condos. <laughs> I know, amazing. Yeah, if you don't know it, if you're driving on the turnpike, mm -hmm. you know, shall we say south mm -hmm. on the extension, mm -hmm. you see these beautiful mm -hmm. buildings that are stepped, yes. kind of like kind of Art Deco-ish, because yeah, that's much. when they're built. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they are now, I think mm -hmm. it's the Beacon, mm -hmm. which are kind mm -hmm. of luxury condos, mm -hmm. which are kind of a separate little enclave mm -hmm. from the rest of that yes, area. Yes, it is. And fancy. Yeah, you know, I have a tiny piece of the original um, Jersey City Medical Center. I have a small piece of marble. My father, they were destroying it when they were rebuilding, yes. you know, converting it. My father, it was the end of my father's days there. He said, do you want something? Do you want a piece of marble? He said to me. And I pair leather on it. You need a non-porous oh, surface. Yes. So in my studio, I have this little, like, 20-inch square piece of sure. marble gotcha. that I look at, and I think, Jersey City Medical Center, who right. would thunk, right? Right, and connection <laughs> of your dad, yes. so that's pretty yeah. cool. And they met, my parents met at the hospital. My really? mother was a nurse. Oh, uh -huh. yeah. I like that. Yeah. And uh, my father always told us that he wowed my mother by doing a spinal tap in under two minutes and causing the patient no pain, and that's what won her over. Wow, romantic. Yes. But my, my mother has never recalled that episode. Yeah, so. that's, that's like family yeah. urban <laughs> legends. Yes, yeah, it is. definitely. But it's very sweet. They met, they married, and they stayed in Jersey City where she, her family was. Very cool. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to guess, what was, uh, so, you know, Jersey City, and Hoboken or share two borders, actually. Mm -hmm. And what was uh, your uh, perception of Hoboken living in Jersey City? Well, um, the first time I came to Jersey City was when I was about, I mean, ca yeah, came to Hoboken was when I was about 10. My father on Saturdays would put us all into the station wagon. He made house calls. He made them in Hoboken because he spoke Italian and there were a lot of, he had a lot of Italian patients. So he would drive into Hoboken on Saturdays, and we'd be in the car. And we never got out of the car. But we'd go to a house, and he'd put his doctor on call placard in the window. 
and he'd go into the house with his backpack. And by the way, he double parked. This was, you could not park in Hoboken 60 years ago even. That's right. There you go. Yeah. Anyhow, so he'd go into the house and um, eventually a woman would come out with a plate of cookies, <laughs> you know, and pass them into the car. And then she'd say to my brothers, and which of you is gonna, going to become a doctor like your father? And then we'd, you know, get back, he'd come out, he'd get back in the front, we'd drive to the next house, we'd sit double parked, and a woman would come out with cookies and ask the same question. And I will tell you, my, one of my sisters became a doctor, none of the boys. Oh, okay, so there, there you go. There, there you go. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Those cookies had an influence. <laughs> yeah, they ignored, you know, we were girls, we weren't sure. asked the yeah, question. Yeah, no, it of was course, the 60s. of course, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so what kind of car was that, that station wagon? We had a Buick station wagon. Okay, uh -huh. yeah. And what street did you live on? We lived on Bentley Avenue um, between the boulevard and West Side Avenue. Right. So, uh -huh. you, so you call it the boulevard as a, yeah. like it was, I think its proper name was Hudson Boulevard before it, it was JFK. renamed. Yeah, which yeah, is just, after his yeah, you know, demise. Was, right. Um, we just called so it the boulevard. The boulevard, mm -hmm. yeah. And occasionally you'll see different references to Hudson Boulevard, mm -hmm. like on a bank building uh -huh. or things like uh -huh. that. But most people yeah. do call it JFK. Yes. Yeah. And that street runs, what, like Bayonne to North Bergen? Yes. It's mm -hmm. pretty much north mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. south mm -hmm. and cuts through mm -hmm. all the towns mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we got some shots okay. here. So there's this my is mother. Halloween, which we it's, just celebrated it, here exactly. in Hoboken. But at that time, um, that's Mary, the Do Donald Duck is my sister Mary. I'm in the middle and that's my sister Elaine. And um, we went trick-or-treating on Thanksgiving in those days. Really? It wasn't done on Halloween on October 31st. I, that's a new one. Well, is that like a they, Bentley Avenue tradition? No, or? it was from, we didn't live there then. We had lived in this rental on Liberty yeah. Street or some street. No, I don't know when that, but that was a Thanksgiving picture. And um, hmm. So you can do some research, Bob. And get yeah. Back to us. I, you don't you know, believe me. I, you well, don't believe <laughs> let's do a fact check while we're on air. <laughs> no, no. No. Googling. Googling, no. right. <laughs> no. Anyhow, um, yeah. So true. that is, um, and actually, um, when friends see this photograph of me and my, you know, diamonds, they think that's where my love of pattern and color started. Because Could be. I make papers that look remarkably like that. Okay. <laughs> so it really got an imprint yeah. on yeah. you yeah. at an yeah. early age. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Cool. And, yeah. And that's, you know, 19, that's when I graduated from eighth grade. So that's years later on Bentley Avenue. Yes. My father's post, of course, which sat and plunked into our lawn for 40 years. Yeah. His name, and my three brothers. Three, three brothers. Three yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so just so people don't know, Bentley Avenue is probably the La Creme Street in it Jersey was, City, wouldn't was, you say? It was. It had beautiful Victorian houses on it, so architecturally, and they weren't all alike. It was pretty wonderful, yeah. the variety. Sure. And um, many of them, like our house, had been converted, part of it was converted to an office, so you lost a few good rooms to the service right. of medicine. You know, sure. a few libraries and parlors got right. demolished. But, but yes, it was a beautiful street. And still is. It, it still is, yes. Right. I go back every now and then. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, once in a while, I'll take a walk around. Holly and I will take a walk around, and we'll, uh -huh. you know, let's check out Bentley yeah, Avenue. Yeah, and yeah. so I'm going to check mm -hmm. out that house okay. that you're in. I'm okay. kind of, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, many, places over the years would have been broken into smaller apartments, mm -hmm. maybe a little of that, mm -hmm. but for mm -hmm. the most Not part, seemed to be single mm -hmm. family, mm -hmm. yes. still maintained yes. and yes. paying those taxes yes. and yep. Yep. all that. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, okay, here is my playground, Lincoln Park, uh, th you know, three blocks from the house, two blocks from our house. And we used to just go and climb on Abraham Lincoln and, um, and I and walk on that bench in the background, and I remember, you know, putting our fingers in with malice toward none, with charity towards all. Which is, is that what it says? And you it remember said. it? Well, wow. yes, because it was a daily. It was after school. Sure. That's what we do. And, yeah. Um, you know, I I'd like to think maybe that was where my interest in type interest in typography came from. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure it wasn't, but you know, it, we tell our thing people. Yeah. We tell ourselves things. If right? the shoe fits, wear it. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. But that was a. Of wonderful and it still looks like that it's it does quite beautiful. it does mm -hmm. yeah if people don't know lincoln park it's one of the great parks in this area for sure mm -hmm. and has lots of amenities and mm -hmm. open space mm -hmm. and 
you can have like 10 field events going on mm -hmm. and they don't step on each yes. other. And yeah. I, I'm always marveled yeah. uh, at, at that. How it yeah. Mm -hmm. And but I don't think Lincoln Park is its original name. Oh no. I think it was originally like Hudson, you know, Boulevard Park or you know, so, oh. whatever, and mm. uh, yeah. goes back to you know. 1920s uh -huh. time period, uh -huh. but at some point it became Lincoln yeah, Park yeah. for sure mm -hmm. on there. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of parades start from there, yes. right? Yep, uh, yep. All that I see. Mm -hmm. And then they recently changed the configuration. It's not two-way traffic, or it is, t uh, yes, so one-way traffic going around. You have to go around the whole thing. Oh, it used know. to be two-way traffic, yeah, yeah. and I think they put bike lanes on both uh -huh. sides mm -hmm. and behind going west you have that beautiful fountain yes. that's been restored yes, yes. and uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to think the people who designed this felt they were doing kind of a, a Paris kind of park. Well, you it had know? those steps leading downhill yeah. to Westside Avenue. It just keeps going. Broad, I know, steps and cupolas and I mean yeah. gorgeous It starts uh, on the boulevard yes. and goes now it goes to the other side of one to nine because mm. you have the golf course oh. that's all part mm. of it mm. it's huge well, good for jersey city right definitely definitely if mm -hmm. someone's looking to get out of hoboken mm -hmm. uh so someone is saying oh this must be rand that's he's good. been doing our fact checking uh -huh. apparently ragamuffin day was on thanksgiving and the kids would trick or treat them there you go oh my god okay <laughs> okay <laughs> Another holiday that has been uh, kidnapped by the adults or something. I guess it was get the kids out of the house yeah. while we're mm -hmm. cooking the turkey mm -hmm. or something. Well, I think that's why we were in the station wagon on Saturday mornings, to get the kids out of the house, That could be, by too. The way. Yeah, because yes. you're going to go to the cinema mother, on Sunday. My mother could, you know, have a few hours by herself. That but yeah, get the kids out of the house. So that was six kids in the station no, wagon? No, because we yeah. were staggered. Yeah. You know, there's a 12-year... Oh, I got yeah, it. Yeah, from yep. oldest to youngest. That so there was some much. combination yep. of that. Yep. Yeah. It's actually a beautiful picture of Lincoln Park. Did you take it? No. Or it's from a postcard? <laughs> yes. Or? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. And then we'll probably get a little more into your book binding. Yes, that should and, come And uh, this. here's, this is a, looks like a storefront. It's and the, tell us more. Yes. It's where I became a book binder. <laughs> Center for Book Arts, which was on Bleecker Street in the Bowery, and it was as, as petite as it looks. You go in, there's a press occupying one whole window. Um, it was tiny, and it was wonderful. And that's where they had a full-fledged apprenticeship in bookbinding and printing, which meant it was funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities, so there was a procedure to it all. It wasn't mm -hmm. a haphazard sort of education. Sure. And... Um, but I it still the, looks a little informal. Oh, it was extraordinarily informal. That's a very, yeah, that's a kind interpretation of what was going on behind that door. But it was a fabulous place. And, you know, later on I thought I should have removed the bottles and the garbage before taking the photo. But <laughs> it was on the Bowery, and our neighbors were the men who lived on the Bowery. Right. They were the people who we dealt with daily. And they were good neighbors. Uh, you, you'd walk down the street, and if one approached you for money, he would be reprimanded by somebody else who said, no, you can't ask her. She's on the street. There was a real protocol. Really? And then, um, yeah. And I mean, because when I was first thinking, like, I see these gates on the door, and I'm going, who would break into a bookbinding place? This like, is, oh, we're going to carry this guillotine know, press yeah, around. Yeah, who would break into a... So maybe there was another business before, and these I are... I don't know what... We <laughs> locked it at night. Maybe it just protected the glass from being broken. Okay, you know? could be. And yeah. in fact, my first day as an apprentice, my job was to take down those gratings over the windows, those metal grates, and wash the windows. And really? Wash. And I'm thinking, huh, okay. <laughs> so when I was doing it, I'm thinking, oh, this is what an apprenticeship is like. I thought I'd be learning how to set type. Right, you could have hired subcontracted, hired <laughs> yes. the guys who were panhandling. Yes, that's right. what I should have done. Right. But I love this place. It's really where I became a bookbinder. And, um, so what, like, what is the impetus for being a bookbinder? I mean, well, um, yeah, what is the impetus? I, it was a combination of being a reader and being someone who wanted to paint, mm -hmm. and bringing those two together. Right. So knowing there is illustration or decorative elements to a book, and there's usually a story to be told in a book. It it sort of came together and. Um, 
So are you a big reader and those type, like, yes. you know, I'm just thinking yeah. of classic like Moby Dick that would always have those type of illustrations? Well, maybe or... when I was in my 20s, okay. Moby Dick didn't occur. When I was really being formed, it was Nancy Drew illustrations, of course. Right. which were right. great. And sure. I, ha I have a picture of that. But yes, I mean, the. Um, it, so I think that's what led me, those two different paths of art and, and visual, visual and arts that, and literature. And did that just come out of just... Um, I'll say escapism from all the brothers and sisters in reading or school or we read we didn't have we weren't allowed to watch TV uh-huh why we watched it maybe on weekends because we did homework and we read it was right. just not it was just that's how it was I don't even remember feeling too deprived although sure. occasionally until you talk to other kids on the way to school I'd yeah. hear what happened sure. you know, on yeah. whatever show. I felt like I was up to date because of those sure. conversations but reading was just what we did and loved it so it never felt like punishment and um, and was that yeah. more from your mother or father or was kind of a, a yeah, they I just kind know. of agreed it doesn't seem to have been directed it was mm -hmm. just there I right. can't answer that it's curious yeah yeah yeah, sure. yeah. Um, I actually had the same thing in my family we didn't right. own a TV till we were about maybe 14 uh -huh. and my grandparents bought it because they thought we were being deprived uh, and uh, sweet. yeah so yeah. it was kind of interesting yeah. and then we'd watch 24 hours a day right? <laughs> yes. farmer programs in the morning and oh, you know all funny. that stuff yeah. anyway but yeah. I'm looking at this let's go back okay. one more uh -huh. so is there much signage saying what goes on here well or? you see printing that word on the right oh there it is <laughs> no, yeah there wasn't much um it was a look derelict but it was yeah there wasn't much and who was there is there a staff is there we had a director right and we had a couple of teachers uh-huh event and it was um well i will tell you i went back recently and it's a posh dress fashionable sure the bowery dress is designers. kind of upgrade upscaled yes. and i was looking in the window where that press is on the left hand side it was bare space and I went into the dress shop and I saw the floor, the finish on the floor was a little different there because that press stood there for so many years right. and it was very heavy. Mm -hmm. And I decided, I just went and I stood there like to get, bring back sure. the press. And a saleswoman came over and said, can I help you? And I said, no, thank you. I explained there right. used to be a press here and I'm just going to stand here for a moment. <laughs> and she said, okay. And she, she called 911. No, she right. just walked away. But yeah, it was, well, people, there were, it was just the beginning of this whole revolution, I think, where paper makers were being established, hand paper making, around sure. the corner on Crosby Street, which was right. e equally derelict. Sure. A fabulous hand paper making studio that's entering its 50th year. Wow. There were print shops, and um, people were just becoming interested in craft all over again. So I what think. time period are this we? This is the 80, 1980s. Right. Uh -huh. or, yeah, late 70s, early uh -huh. 80s. Book, handmade books yes. were like yes. a real thing. Yes. And... Um, so, but that moment that you go visit and it's now a dress shop, yeah. like, was it really sad? It was. Or, I it would was imagine. Sad because I love that. Look yeah. at that. What's no. not to love? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. Um, but uh, yeah. I can see you, like, you know, the smell. This probably had a distinctive yeah. smell. The yes. leather, the glues. Yeah, the inks. Right. Um, the downstairs where, with the dirt floor where trees were growing, basically, <laughs> among the type cases. Right, it's, right. I can be very but, So is there any evidence that this was? Only that piece of worn floor. Right, That's right. it. And only you would, you yes, know, would know. know what it was. <laughs> yes. yes, yeah. <laughs> but that's mm -hmm. pretty cool. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that New York does always change mm -hmm. and anyone who's lived in this area you know mm -hmm. in new york let's mm -hmm. say who goes into new york so many of the restaurants so many of the businesses that we probably came here for mm -hmm. almost or found mm -hmm. that you know that's what we love about new york yes. have changed yes. and it is bittersweet it is bittersweet right. um i learned i was so lucky to be there at that time because there were other craftspeople in nooks and crannies in the neighborhood right. who you would never have known were there. And they were mostly older, second generation immigrants right. carrying on their father's crafts. And of course, I mean, they were old, older men mostly. But um, like, like pen, a pen ruling, two men who ran a pen ruling business. I don't um, even know what that pa is. Paper ruling, you know the composition books with blue lines the blue line that books. we all yeah. well, when they were hand up they did it by hand hand yeah it was yeah pen ruling 
presses. And there were two men in their 80s, when, well, they were in their 70s to 80s when I knew them, and their fathers had set up these presses in like the 19, 1910, 1920. They were from Italy. And I would bring batches of paper over, and I could decide the, the space between lines and the color blue, or whatever. and I'd bring those beautiful, and they would rule it. Wow. And when I went over one day with the batch of paper, they said, by the way, you're our last job because they were old, they were yeah. 80, and sure. nobody, and he said, and by the way, would you like one of the two presses they have? And um, it was massive, I mean, you, yeah. it was huge. No, sure. the answer, if I had known you, Bob, you would have taken it, right? Uh, Maybe, you yeah. might have taken it. Sure. But anyhow, they, the, Smithsonian, the Smithsonian was taking one of them, mm -hmm. and the other one was gonna be junked. And right. it had carved cherry wooden legs, it yeah. had, um, it had, brass gears and mm -hmm. beautiful things. So right. on the day it was being taken apart to go be in the, put into the dumpster, I went over and these men were, other men, you know, workmen were disassembling it and they would hold up a piece and I would say either yes or no. The and piece. Was, yeah, the piece. so I brought pieces home. Right. Including some of the wooden legs. Right. But it was, and their last client had been the New York City Police Department. They used to have hand ruled paper for signing in criminals. Do you believe it? I do. And then it yeah. went all computerized and right. and they had and they had no work and I mean anyhow they sure. were old they had to read. Yeah. No, I can like but once in a while we'll get a pile of like ledger books yes. from yes. 1870s yes. beautifully bound yes. starting to deteriorate but yes. you open them up and they're the fresh papers. as can be. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so it's that type yeah. of thing. So they were one of many similar people hidden in the nooks and crannies. Right. In a a Civil War, a building on Mott Street, a basement, which had been a Civil War prison, was where a books, a books, a cellar of book cloth that we used to cover books with. It was dark. There were cells. So there were these little alcoves, and there would be a bin of cloth in there, and you'd have to pull it out into the light, and s the one light bulb, wow. it, and then put it back if you didn't want it. I mean, there were, but there were so many of these people. It you must have loved that. Yes. I mean, it's, I'm yes. glad you're able to witness yes. it and, yeah. and keep I mean, it in your yeah. memory. I mean, I'm trying to remember what Armando said when he was interviewed, and he said there aren't, there's no such thing as the good old days, like these are the good old days. Mm -hmm. So I have to try to rein in my feeling that those were the good old days. But right. I know that those people are gone. And um, Sure. Well, you're and continuing the tradition of your true. craft, yeah. Yeah. so that's, yeah. you know, it's kind sort of. of like they influenced you. Yes. So you are it. Okay. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> i got to work harder. Yeah, Whoa. definitely. It's sort of like people talk about, you know, whatever happened to all the characters in Hoboken. Yeah. And, and I say, we They're are here. the characters. Yes. So yes. we have that responsibility yes. to yeah. be a little, little wacky. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's our calling. Mm -hmm. um, so when did the book center, it still exists, it you're still saying? It still exists. It moved from Bleecker Street to Broadway and Houston to an unfinished floor. Right. And um, that was there for 10 years, and now it's in Chelsea. So I'm going to guess it's on a second floor, third floor? It's or it's, third floor. It must mm -hmm. be, yeah. yeah. So they yeah. must, to get all that stuff up, Yeah. what do they do? Taking the windows out? And well, these are industrial buildings. Okay, so, it so wasn't, they're used to yes, it. Yes, yeah, yeah, that sure. was not true. But much. rents on first floors are prohibitive, so yeah. they're taking oh, yeah. a different mm -hmm. style mm -hmm. space mm -hmm. on there. Mm -hmm. So take us a little bit through what book binding is. Mm -hmm. I mean, and then you do lots of different types of binding or book yes. arts. Yes. Um, I, my training, I was trained as a traditional book binder and um, with a sort of link to conservation binding, which is its own field. It's more scientific and you're, of course, working on older books. Book binding, working with new materials, is quite a different field. And so you kind of have to sift through and decide what you feel you're best at in those. Sure. And um, so I worked for a while at the New York Botanical Garden in the book conservation department. Mm -hmm. um, loved the old books and then decided that I wanted to concentrate on new books, new materials, and working with living people, like being a collaborator. Sure. So the production of much of, the, the, many of the books I worked on involved a paper maker, a printer, a printmaker, you know, the end person is the bookbinder, so you're at the end of this chain, but you all have to figure it out before anybody does anything. So and this would be like even like a portfolio presentation yes. box is mm -hmm. considered what you would do also. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's not a book book, 
but it, it's... It could be many things, books, boxes, portfolios, albums. Right. Um, sometimes the requirement comes from someone, a painter or someone who draws, who can't afford to lose any information in the gutter of the book where it's sure. paged. He needs you absolutely think about flat all that. surface. So you have sure. to figure out the binding to suit the use of the book. Yes, it's it's... A lot of it is... You can't do this virtually. You can't do it on <laughs> Zoom. No. I, I was asked if I wanted to teach on Zoom. Right. And, and that would be teaching. I'll but see you. And yeah. three years later, I'm back in a classroom, so <laughs> yes, I'm, happy. I'm happy about that. Sure. But, um, yes, and then as a, since I had, you know, painting was an interest of mine, I made my own painted books, and I actually took a book lending class because I wanted to bind 10 small paintings I had made, my first book lending class, thinking a three-month class would tell me everything, and then, um, you know, years and years, I stayed on, let me put it that way. So right. <laughs> when I realized there's more here than meets the eye to how you make a book, sure. and what are the materials. Mm -hmm. And so is there an audience for a new generation learning to bookbind? I think it's booming. Right. There are so few places you could learn bookbinding in my day, and now many universities have it's usually incorporated in the printmaking department, so it would be printmaking and book arts. Everybody seems to be teaching or taking book arts. Okay. Book That's and I good. guess for a, a while, England would have been the England big place the to source. learn yes. uh, the traditional yeah. craft. Right. People of my generation went right. to England. Sure. Mm -hmm. and, but now there are places... It's here. Okay. I would say it's here. And what would be some of the stronger institutions uh, well, for this? Well, foremost is my beloved Center for Book Arts. Mm -hmm. I'll always put that first. Good. But different regions, there's San Francisco Center for the Book, there's Minnesota Center for the Book, um, there is a school in Boston, Bennett Street, which teaches restoration of books, and then there are programs within universities that have conservation right. um, programs, which didn't exist in my day. In my day, your training was as an apprentice. You had to find someone who knew more than you, mm -hmm. and that's how you learned it. Right. And then degree programs began De developing, and that was a whole different way to get your sure. education. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just thinking of like restoration. Mm -hmm. You have this old book, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it's mm -hmm. the leather is deteriorating mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. it sort of naturally does. Mm -hmm. It wasn't taken mm -hmm. care of, mm -hmm. but it might have some nice detailing and mm -hmm. so on. So, like, what do you do? Do you just rip out all that old binding and start from scratch, or is there a way to sort of incorporate it, some of the integ some you know, of the original I, my stuff? Next slide Go for it. Go for it. My next slide shows somebody dealing with an old book with lots of okay. leather book with lots of problems. There you go. There you go. That was Bernard Middleton, who was the book conservator at the British Museum, wow. and I was two months into my apprenticeship, and he came to the Center for Book Arts to teach a two-week-long class, and. Um, I didn't think I should have been in that class. I mean, I didn't know that much, but... Um, oh, Rose. <laughs> Rose you. Perry. Who's Rose? <laughs> Rose is my Tai Chi buddy. That's right. Yes. Uh, Rose and uh, Barbara <laughs> and uh, another pos another group are here for Tai Chi yeah. with Peter mm -hmm. and uh, every Wednesday. Thanks for tuning Thank you, in, Rose. Barbara. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyhow, so Bernard I meant Middleton... I to say Rose. <laughs> I knew that. He... Um, I learned in that two weeks, I learned more from that man that had nothing to do really with how to fix the book exactly. Right. Sure. But what you're seeing is his hand, his finger is in the paste. He's putting paste on the spine of the book yeah. with his finger. And he, you know, that was lesson number one, use your fingers, you know, get your fingers in the adhesive. But m more importantly, when we were, he, we were working on a collection of 18th century and 18th century books, I was given one to re do something to restore, repair, and we had a punch these holes in the towards the spine of the book at the front where the cover had detached and so I had my little awl and I thought I shouldn't be doing this nobody should be punching holes and I wiggled my tool in and he watched me and he came over and he took it from me and he went bang 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 and suddenly <coughs> there were it. five huge yeah, holes sure. and then he handed the tool back to me and he said you must show the book who's in charge oh wow and I can I hear that voice you know 30 35 mm -hmm. years later when I'm hovering and sure. not, I don't know what to do and right. it's basically do something just do something sure and um so he was a great he was a master he, again he was it was fabulous so <coughs> people like that came in as you see that he's keeping the leather and he's bringing it back to life, although leather really never can be brought back right. to life. It rots, it's gone, Yeah, it's gone. So yeah. oftentimes you make a rare book box for it, or if it's in terrible shape, 
you know, rebinding is something quite different. It's not keeping any of the original <coughs> right. materials. Restoration is keeping the as much of the original and trying to either fashion new materials mm -hmm. you know, that sure. mimic the old ones. So, um, so do book, I don't know, you have a great sense of humor, but for some reason I don't think bookbinders would. I don't oh. know why, I'm sorry. Oh. It's just so serious. It's a barrel of laughs. And all that We're glue. We're fun. Okay. We're fun to be around. Okay. Yeah, glue okay. is a problem. That, it's a problem for many people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I take it all back. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. But yeah. uh, he looks pretty serious. He was but, serious. Yeah, yeah. and but, I mean, he had to be, but the thing is, because of where he grew up in England and in his, in his era, he had to f have a trade at the age of 12 or 13. Right. Remember, they were... Sure, yeah, Dickens, they right. Privileged. <laughs> but his father worked at the, Brit the British Museum, so sure. he, he went to work he, there. But he well, I had this conversation with him where he was almost wistful about what he might have been, if not that, when to us he was the god, you know? Right, it, right. Um, it, 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 so it's, uh, yeah, but he, marvelous people like that entered yeah, my life. No, and, um, they were, yeah. yeah. Is bookbinding one book at a so time? So Eric is asking, is bookbinding one book at a time or many books? It's book uh, it's binding one, for me, it's binding one book at a time, and it could be an addition of 10, 50, 100 books. But for me, it was never more than 100. If, at that scale, it would probably go to a trade bindery. Sure. Or a more commercial right. venture because of the labor involved. But if you have many stages with a book and you had multiple books, would you, you know, work on them from beginning to end, or well, would you? Let me tell you, Bernard Middleton. Yes. In that previous slide, the other thing I learned from him, he had like a seven-year waiting period for his work. Wow. People would bring him books, and they would wait a long time. And he said, "What we should do is, if you have a number of books in your studio, work." A little bit on each book and then when the customer calls you irate you can say I'm working on it I got it okay <laughs> there you go so instead of finishing it for you know maybe sure it, it is you have to work on multiple books because you can't finish anything That's what because I, of adhesives drying sure, so you do sure. have to have yep. so additions are wonderful if mm -hmm. you you know so 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 go back to the beginning glue right. glue 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 whatever. got it yeah. in stages yeah. baby steps yes. Yes. cool cool mm -hmm. and um, okay what do we got here? Well, you have this is some of your influences. Yeah, this is my influence. I mean, I think every girl who's ten wants to be, you know, Nancy Drew. Right, as I mean, opposed to the Hardy Boys. <laughs> yes, who I never. Read. I mean, Nancy Drew. There was no parental involvement in her life. She hung around with her friends. She was got in trouble and almost died, but never did. But anyhow, what I loved. I don't have that many books saved from my childhood, but I have my Nancy Drew books. And in the next slide, you will see the. Um, reason why they have these the end sheets look at that beautiful and so I I I thought well you know you could be a girl detective or you maybe you could make things that look like this right. and I think that might have been an influence mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what is your typical client this is Irene again yeah. what is your typical client, client now? now a person's favorite treasure or museums uh, and institutions uh, and I should mention Irene uh, and and uh, yourself live on the same we're block we're neighbors your neighbors hello Irene yeah and, uh, I, I have no typical client. I know that sounds odd, but um, I have worked for institutions. I've worked for individuals. I uh, no book has ever seemed to even resemble any other book. I've made hundreds of hundreds of thousands of books, and yet each book doesn't seem all that familiar to me when I start it at the beginning with its materials. So um, probably more individuals than institutions. And I'm kind of retired now. I do my own art books. I paint pages and I bind them. And so that's where most of my time, aside with combined with teaching, that's how I, I, I make things you know, with my students. But yes, huh. Irene, I will talk to you privately about this. <laughs> <laughs> and Thank is you. it physically hard? I mean, book binding? I mean, you're cutting, you're sewing, or am you're, I wrong? No, you're standing. You you're have to stand right. over the workbench for. Sure. Yes. And um, it is a physically long. It is hard. Thank you. Well, I don't think most people would even. Right. Think of well, that. I just. Anything yeah. cutting and well, you're physically you cut, focusing. You hammer to shape the spine right. of a book. You put 
heavy things in and out of presses, you mm -hmm. know, to boards or under right. big weights. And, um, and very specialized tools, yeah, right? Yeah. You need one yeah. particular hammer yeah. and, yeah. Uh, you know, not too heavy, not yeah. too light. If you and can't find it, you're in pause. Yes. Where's I, my hammer? I know, but I, I read once the requirements in the 18th century for an apprentice. And first of all, you had to be male, which was not uh, unexpected. You had to have perfect vision because you had eyeballs so much. And you had to be illiterate. So you didn't read and slow down the process. Oh, my God. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. 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 I mean, it wasn't hard as hard to be illiterate back then, but that was a requirement. Right. So literacy. therefore, no women could do it because they're all right. literate. No. <laughs> yes. uh. Well, I was also taught always oh, when I would restore a book rebind with rebinding, you start at the back of the book. I was taught this with the pages upside down to you. So you're going from back to front, and you can't read because the text is upside down. Right, so, and, and it's hence a distraction? Yeah, yeah, because if you read, you slow down the whole process. So you're not as valuable as an employee either. That's a little I scary. Know. Yeah. I know. So talk about um, your, most of the people you met coming up were male, yes. uh, but I, I've only met a few bookbinders, and they yeah. just happen to be women. So uh, I guess it's the, changing a yeah, little? Yeah, I think in the hand bookbinding world, they were there are women right. because even the sewing of a book was always considered women's work. So, sewing, of course. Yeah. So in the 1940s, when the New York Public Library had its bindery, which had maybe 40 employees, a huge really? room on the bottom level, they had, I think, four women, and they were called the headband girls <laughs> because they embroidered those the decorative yeah. elements across the head and tail. So you're book. saying the other 36 were male? Uh-huh. Wow. Uh -huh. Wow. And, um, it, m women were only allowed to do certain processes, but the covering of a book with leather and the tooling was always men only. They were just not taught that. They weren't allowed to. Right. That was considered too important. So, um, but nowadays it's, you know, it's probably more female than male. That's what I, I By, by yeah. my students, at least. Sure. It comes yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But there's a lot of people who are not really, they're probably doing more art books, too. That's it, right? yes. And personal mm -hmm. projects, yes. so that's yes. what drives it yes. a little yeah. more. Yeah, we're not talking about trade binderies, yep. you know, where sure. it's very or important to produce it. Or the restoration as yes. much. Yes, So yep. on there. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool, cool. Mm -hmm. And so here we well, are in art books. Yeah, well, this is sort of a restoration, actually. Ah. Um, a friend handed me a baggie filled with remnants of an 18th century illustrated book that had been in a house fire and was also water damaged hmm. after the fire. So there were fragments of these pages in this bag, and she said, here, you'll like this. <laughs> so I took it home. I separated all these people based on what they were wearing. I recreated. It was a book called Women of the Bible from Abigail to the Queen of Sheba. The title page was partially there, and it had the date of 1798. And so it was a story and then a full page, beautiful lithographic reproduction, you know, illustration. Sure. So I separated all the bits and pieces into piles. It was like pathology, you know, it was science. It mm -hmm. was, and the fragments were no larger than two inches. So I built these little cubes and I put the faces on one side. And if you turn it, you find the arms. If you turn it, you find the skirts, like those puzzle, children's right. puzzle blocks. And then I made a, a, a surface that opens one of the facets, a door opens and the, their story pulls out on an accordion fold. Wow. So, so I had to go read the Bible because I didn't yeah. know what happened to them all. Sure. I had to summarize. You know, and everyone reason. had to have a head covering, right? You know, they do. I never thought of that. <laughs> so that was sort of a restoration and an artist book. But you did, you sort of transformed oh, I did. something. I, I painted in. And, uh, yeah, yeah. It was just taking something that would have been disposed of right. because it was quite damaged. But um, it was. Can, did it have back. a smoky smell? No, I don't think so. Okay, I don't just wondering. That. Yeah. yeah, sometimes so it's is, hard to get rid of. So do you see the block? They tumble around. I had no idea there was depth to it oh, until you showed okay. me this. Oh, okay. Yeah, there were two-inch so, cubes. So what's inside the cube? The story of whoever you see on the outside. Wow, and so that's like in a paper. It's an accordion scroll. Fold book. Oh, you said that. Yeah, yeah and quite. because the tension of the the accordion is is compressed. So right. when you open that door, you little jack in the box. It, it, exactly. Yeah, sure. Yes. So that was very cool. And you got that beautiful patterning. Yes. Patterner. Yeah. And I painted, I dyed the frames, and and so it was just a wonderful project. To, right. Um, and so this is not a client. This is no, this your was project. This was for me, and this wow. is what I do. This is this is what, what you're doing now, and why I, gets the blood yes. going. And yes. 
Yeah. yeah, yeah. So are you asking people to send in their fragments? or I would take any. Okay, we'll look around. <laughs> Anything on paper. Yeah, definitely. Um, and this is another, aside from Nancy Drew, the only other book I have for my childhood is this. Here's oh, Rose thank going, you, Rose. yeah. And, and we have a picture of Jim, too. Oh, yeah. oh, Very cool. that's sweet. <laughs> yes. Um, this was a book I got when I was 10, and what I rem why I have it, why it was so important, is the gold border on the pages, really. This I is, got it. And also the fact that the type is, a hand, the font is handwriting. And I never, you know, the notion that you could write and that could be a real book, your own handwriting could become part of a book as opposed to the formal look of a, mm -hmm. you know, a certain typeface. I think that is what I recall when I, why I love this book so much. Right. And so I, in, I have gold borders on almost everything I make. <laughs> <laughs> and I have handwriting in most of my books. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, again, who knows when you're 10 years old what's going to matter to you. Right. And, um... Yes, so that's why I have shown this. I have a book of my own which has a border, I mm -hmm. think, coming up. And um, yeah, well, that's a gold border. Um, gotcha. And talk about the paper a little. Handmade paper. I mean, Did love. You, and of do materials. you make your own paper? No. No. In fact, I hate paper making. I've really? had to make paper at conferences and all. Ugh, it's Can wet. Can you describe it's, the process? Yeah, you have these vats of water. You have pulp that you've pounded for days to get it or put it into a machine to chop it up, linen or cotton or plant fiber. And then you put these screens into the vat of water and you pull it up and the water is released and the pulp stays on the screen. And then you put it between felt and you put it in a press and you're wearing boots and it's really cold because it's probably winter when you're doing this. Okay. And, um, and then you have to get uniform sheets. I mean, you have to be good at it. It's not just going through that process. Right. It's got to be the same kind of thickness, weight, thru exactly. thickness throughout. And, and, um, and it's just not my cup of tea at all. Right. I want to get sheets of paper and begin to fold, sew, paint, manipulate, and um, yes. And so it's a specialized uh, art, just making paper. Yeah, hand papering. Oh, it's its own world. It's as important as the bookbinding world and as large as the bookbinding world. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think everyone should do it once, and it's really not that hard to do. No. But uh, you definitely need a lot of room to draw. You do. And yeah. I can remember doing it in college, and I thought my roommate was away for the weekend. I you took over the bathroom to it. do it. and. Like the whole room was no. like a drying rack, and yes. it didn't go well. No. Yeah, I can't see why that wouldn't have happened. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, and then here's the handwriting component. This is a book I made about two or three years ago, swiftly and surely, a book for Hilma, and that's at my drawn H is my handwriting, which occurs throughout the book, right. and again referring to that ten-year-old present of the stories from the Bible with all that handwriting as the story. So um, this is a printed title page, but it's all hand. And published or created in, in Hoboken. It, that's my... We like it, that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So do you know, you don't have to go into names, do you yeah. know other bookbinders in Hoboken? I bet you're one of I, I two. I don't know another, I know, I don't know another bookbinder. Right. Yeah. We know calligraphers. We know calligraphers. Right. Anna Pinto, the marvelous Anna yes. Pinto. Yes. Ibu, thank Ibu. you. Thank I like you, your Ibu. book art there. Beautiful. Oh. Ibu, another neighbor on the bar. My neighbor, Garden Street, yeah, is Gar showing up. So talk about Garden Street a little. Uh -huh. I know we, we don't have yeah. a visual of yeah. it, but to me, when you go downtown, that 200 block of Garden has mm -hmm. some of the best people in Hoboken. I would have to agree. Right? Yes. I mean, uh -huh. starting yeah. with you and your sister, <laughs> but uh, Liz, uh, Ibu. Yes. Uh, Irene. Irene, uh, the Newmans. Yes. Uh-huh. And, uh, it's a great street, and um, yeah, it's a great street. And you know, I've lived there for thirty-one or two years. But right. um, and it was great for the moment. My first day there, my first night, having moved into the house, it was winter, and I had come home from the Center for Book Arts, and I was walking down the street, and I heard someone walking a few steps behind me. I just knew there was a person. Anyhow, I went up my steps, and I put my key in the door, and I realized I was, I was at the wrong house. <laughs> So I went back down and I went over one house, they, you know, row houses. And Those it was houses dark. look a little similar. And I had never been there before to live in. So I go up the steps and I put my key in and then the door opened. Company. And then two doors away, the, whoever was behind me 
was now in front of me, and it was Liz, my neighbor Liz. She walked up the stairs and she said, and I glanced over. I knew she had seen me make my big mistake, and she just said, welcome to the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> so she did welcome me to the neighborhood. That's and pretty then, cool. From, from that moment, it was I felt welcomed to mm -hmm. the neighborhood. Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah, it's funny. If I meet an artistic person and they say they live on Garden Street, I will say, oh, the 200 block. <laughs> and invariably, it's someone who just moved to town, they're probably renting, and they're renting maybe across the street on yes. the west side. Yes. And I don't know who the owners yes. are, but yeah. there are just a lot of creative people mm -hmm. on that block. Oh, it's, true. Nice. it's true. It's true. It's yeah. true. Um, so that's that same book we just saw. That's my handwriting again on the back of it. I was inspired by this artist, Tilma Ofklint, who worked in the 1900 to 1940. She was a mystic and a Swedish painter, and she had seances, and she basically listened to the spirits and said she painted whatever they told her to paint swiftly and surely. Thank you, Irene. And um, I took her swiftly and surely as my title. And so I thought, well, I'm going to channel Hilma of Clint. And that's how I, that's what I wrote. Mm. Very right, cool. The back of the book. Very right. cool. Yeah, so it's, yeah. So anyway. that's not printed handwriting. That's the actual handwriting. It's handwriting. I made, it, a plate was made of my, I wrote. Oh. And then a polymer plate is a material polymer replaced metal plates or wood cuts would sure. have been the original. And then um, it's put on a printing press, a plate, and then it's inked up. The press is inked. And so it's a printing process. It re requires a, a real And press. is this book an edition, or this is it? It's an edition of three. Wow. Uh -huh. Wow. Yeah. And would you see subtle differences between the two just because of the inking? Or? Oh, there, it, there are major differences because I made my images by cutting stencils. And I drew, first I would draw, since I on the front of the book, which we can no longer see, it's all drawn shapes. And you can't draw the same shape identically. More. Thank you. Thank you, Rand. So like this H, that's, right. the book, that's also on the other two books. But it's a different H, because who can right. reproduce it? Sure. So then I had to cut different stencils to paint in. So each book has its own set of stencils. Yeah, it's... Anyhow, there, there, there are variations yeah, from book to book. Definitely, <laughs> definitely. Mm -hmm. So do you dream books? I do. Tell I me do. about that. Well, frequently, I, again, I don't know. It's when I'm, you know, must show the book in charge and it's not working and I don't know what I'm doing. And, well, it's, it's, I think this happens to a lot of people. When you wake up, you know the solution. You're not quite sure what happened. Uh -huh. And um, that's a great relief. And I, I have vivid dreams, so... I just you know, I, dream. You, I, you know, I, when I meet people who are about passionate about something, mm -hmm. could be a sport, it could mm -hmm. be, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and invariably you dream about it. Yeah. And that's when you yeah. know. Yeah. And, and, and then there are the, the nightmares. I mean, I teach, <laughs> and every time, the night I've been teaching for decades, and the night before a class, I will have, I, I dreamt when I was going to Center for Book Arts, that I got there, and it was called Center for Trapeze Arts. And there was no book this is the dream. This is the dream. Okay. There was no book binding equipment in the room. And there was a single, there was a trapeze. And in one corner was a bolt of book cloth. That was the only evidence of its previous life. So, yeah, I mean, and I shouldn't be having these dreams. I'm a, I mean, I'm a good teacher. It's the way teacher. you're preparing, though. Yes. You know, it's yeah. good to be a little scared. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. interesting. And how about yeah. when I was teaching German that I don't speak? I mean, it, these are, there are many such dreams. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Another, yeah, but anyhow, sure. yeah. And so, so talk about some oh, of the places you've traveled yes. to do your classes. Well, this is my, one of my dearest rec experiences. I was in Colombia, South America. Um, I had taught a woman from Colombia. She came to New York to take a box making class. And, um, and then, she, you know, the class ended. She was great. She was there for a week. And then she said, she came back later in the summer and for a day in my studio with her colleague, her work colleague. They produced photographic books of colonial villages in Colombia. And they spent the day in my studio just doing something small. And then as they were leaving, I'm packing up my stuff. And one says to the other in Spanish, shall we ask her now? And the other one says, no, let's wait. <laughs> and she says, but the other one says, but we're here. And, but I don't know that we should ask. And then I just turned around and said, why don't you ask me now? Because I had, I had high school Spanish. And right. they said, oh, you know Spanish. <laughs> I said, no, I don't know Spanish. Right. And um, they said, what would you say if you were asked to come to the most beautiful town in Colombia and teach, set up a box-making studio? And I said, well, I'd have one question. 
and it was, would there be a board shear? And I told you I'm attached to my, we need that tool. And they said, yes. And I said, okay, yes. And they said, well, surely you have another question. I said, no, if you have a board chair, I will come. When, right. <laughs> yes. And so I went to this village, and the idea was to establish a studio where some of the, it, it, it was townspeople were recruited to take this class. Mm -hmm. It was a month-long class, and there were about 12. A years. month long. Uh-huh. Wow. They came every day except Sundays right. from 1 o'clock until 7 because mm -hmm. the women had to prepare meals for their families, sure. so they weren't available yeah. earlier. And the idea was to reduce the number to a few people who could be employed to keep a box making, decorative boxes, for, well, to be sold in galleries and places operating. And, um, and so my job was to teach them and also to find the four people who would right. want to stay on. Well, anyhow, it was, the, the, there were grandmothers in this class, there were high school, this, this young woman, high mm -hmm. school students, they were beautiful, and um, in this particular project, I had said, we're going to make our own decorative papers because they were importing papers from Italy, you know, which has wonderful printed sure. papers, but the object could have been made in Florence. Right. And I wanted it to be made in this town. I wanted to like, tell people yeah. this is where this was made. So I said to them, we're going to make our own pattern papers. And they said, no, we can't do that because we're not artists. I said, oh, yes, you are. Where do you <laughs> see? So I taught them how to cut stencils, and you... I mean, you can just see the pleasure on Andre. You know, look at them. Sure. You know, yeah. It was just a. So we did. We made our own decorative papers, and then we used those papers to cover the boxes. Mm -hmm. And I went back. At the end, we did. You know, there were a couple of people who were excellent and wanted to stay on and be employed. And then I went back the next year and visited them, and um, they were working on an addition of 300 boxes covered in paper that was made by a papermaker in town. Inset was a little sort of a rug of decorative weaving of, of n indigenous materials that they had dyed. And these boxes were being made for patrons of the Metropolitan Opera House wow. in New York because wow. they had a rich person present, mm -hmm. you know, whoever that happens. Yes. I don't know how that happens. So these are more like presentation they were. boxes. They were gifts for okay. people who had donated. Sure, I was trying to figure but, it out. Um, and here they are holding the first decorative wow. sheets. Nice. Um, very yeah. nice. Kind of reminds me a little of fabric design. Oh, Claire. There's Claire. Beautiful Aww. work. Fascinating Aww. talk. Thank you, Barbara, Thank Bob, you, and Rand. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, they are. I mean, they were, yeah, they were just beautiful. And look at them. They're all so pleased <laughs> with their papers. Yes, and, definitely. Yeah. I had said they're great bugs. They said, what are we going to do? I said, go for a walk and look at the tiles. They were great tiles. You I mean, see tile, century, even the roof tiles. Of course, exactly. Yeah. But this was this was based on a tile. Right. That was based on tiles. Mm -hmm. And I said, and by the way, there are some pretty beautiful bugs flying around. I see bugs. Because yeah. there was no glass in the windows of the studio. They were just tall, 19th century sure. tall windows with bars to keep you from falling out. Right. I said, take a look at the bugs. <laughs> and yeah, look at the bugs. Sure. So, it was a, just a totally beautiful and experience. And was fun and, yeah. and new to them. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. Cool. And, and I think we're getting to, yeah, okay. Oh, so some more this of the is, stenciling. This is stenciling. This is basically what I showed them. And, uh, you know, the two colors that you have separate stencils for orange and red or whatever. You begin to develop a pattern. And then um, the next picture shows you a completed stencil painting. Sure. Yeah, I think of fabric design. I yeah. think of quilting. Yes. I think of, you know, yeah. anything that I has strong pattern. I made quilts before I ever made a book. Oh, really? And, okay. And, pretty, and then after a while, I got rid of the fabric and the paper began to sure. envelop me. Yeah, so yeah, instead, yeah. But then what I was, when I was working on this stencil, if you go to the next slide, I went for a walk um, and I went to, <laughs> I went to, yeah, 4th Street and Church Square Park. That's and right. I saw these guys, and the they were stenciling. Lane. They were making the, and I said, ah, oh, this is great. And I took, they said, why are you taking our picture? I said, I'm doing the same thing in my studio a block away mm -hmm. on a smaller scale. Right. And I, it was, you know, so wonderful. I, so, I remember seeing him do this because yeah. it was like last spring. Yeah, yes, definitely. it was. So it was, and then I, I went back. The Isn't spillover beautiful? is beautiful. Isn't it? Yeah, And then definitely. I went back to my studio, and I continued <laughs> my own stencil right. pictures. So. Cool. Yeah, that's my last slide. So I, yeah. Oh, here's my studio, another here's, view, right. know, aiming out towards Garden, Garden Street. Right. Yeah. I guess, you know, uh, Hoboken was affected by Storm Sandy 10 years ago. Yes. Can you, I, you know, yeah. I hate to bring no. it back, but it what was, happened to your place well, during Storm Sandy? 
I lost my studio, basically. About a foot and a half of water came up through the, um, not in the doors, but you know, through the ground, whatever that sure. is. Sure. And, um, but I, I paid attention to all the warnings and carried, emptied all my paper files. I carried everything I thought was important to me upstairs. But, but did you I have mean, help with the guillotine? That stayed throughout, the, and so you know, the water work, worked up its legs a bit and then went down and I cleaned up the rust. Sure. But that could not be moved. No, no. No. It got taken out afterwards. I sent it to a guy in Pennsylvania who restores those so he could clean it up. And sh so it was out of my studio while the renovation occurred. They did occurred. the floor. So I basically, you know, I took up the wooden floor is gone and you see ceramic tile has replaced that and I the bookcases up high I had <laughs> very my, high they are very high but they, I had bookcases lining my walls they're gone everything right. is up high so I right. sort of redid it in a sure. way that could so with, heaven forbid if heaven it happens forbid, again yes which it has knock so. on tile yes, yes, and uh, yes, you yes. won't have that issue yeah. as much but you know someone said to me wasn't that awful like at the time and I I mean, of course it was awful. Look what everybody lost. Sure. But actually, you know, out on the street with all my neighbors, all having suffered, and it wasn't so awful. It was kind so of... So you're saying bonding a little? Or? Yeah, much of that. And, um, you know, our neighbor, Mudra, who said her sister was driving up from Virginia, and did we need... What food would we like her to bring? And mm -hmm. things like that happened. And, right. um, but it was also... It, it was. It was... It was awful and it was beautiful. Sure. I, I mean, I can relate. I mean, mm -hmm. it was sort of a great equalizer because mm -hmm. we're, we're all in it together. Yes, you know, yes, most of yes. Part. But some blocks did get it worse. Yes. And hopefully neighbors yeah. did kind yes. of lend support. Take care of each other. Mm -hmm. Ten years ago, mm -hmm. uh, like a week after, right? Know, it was I like know. the 28th, know. Or, you know, right Yeah, we were that. thinking October. about that. Everybody, I'm sure, in yeah. Hoboken was thinking, yes, we yeah. do remember. Yeah. We remember so. that date, yeah. Yep, and we, yeah. we tell the story. Mm -hmm. The studio looks great now. Thank and, you. And uh, yeah. looks like things are well on Garden Street. Yes, yep, they are. That's good, mm -hmm. that's good. So, good. just one, we're sort of wrapping yeah. up. Mm -hmm. Are there any other stories you wanted to uh, connect I, on? I. I can't think of anything else. I, I don't know. No, you told a we, lot of great did, ones. Did we talked a lot, right? I, no, we did. We okay. did good. You okay. did good. Okay. Excellent. I think, Excellent. I think that's the end. And uh, do mention that you did have an upper gallery show here yes, at the museum a few years yes. back, and mm -hmm. uh, that was pretty special. It was beautiful. It was yeah. pretty good. I know. Yeah, definitely. I was so pleased to have been Hopefully, another to do that. one will happen yeah, uh, that down nice. the line. So yeah. that'd be good. Yeah. Well, thank so, you. thank you so much, Barbara. Yeah. Thank you, Rand, for engineering tonight. Uh, we'll mention that next Thursday we'll be talking with Jeff Train, who'll be interviewed with, by Bill Curran. And after that, there'll be the return of Stu Cicciarella and Michael Turner, who grew up in Hoboken and will be talking about uh, growing up in town and starting over on the west side, and it'll be out of the studio. It'll be a walkabout yeah, starting yeah. at Mama Johnson Field and uh, should be pretty special. So I uh, do want to thank a few people who've made this program possible. Uh, Mel Kiernan, uh, a year or so ago, uh, you know, included us in his estate planning and past, and we were the recipient of some major funds. So many a big shout-out to yeah. the Mel Kiernan family and the estate. Uh, New Jersey Historical Commission, one of our uh, keystone funders for general operating support and helped uh, make this program possible with new equipment. Uh, New Jersey Council for the Humanities has also come in big. They will be sponsoring our next exhibit, which will go up in January, which will deal with, shall we say, the Hoboken fires in the late 70s and early 80s, which is an amazing and sad time period in Hoboken, but we feel we want to take it on as subject, and it'll be curated by Christopher Lopez, but again, the Humanities Council really helped make it happen. Uh, we do have some key supporters who give at a certain level, who are all listed here, uh, who are part of what we call the Shipyard Circle. Many of them are trustees, and we thank all our trustees. Uh, and then Iron State, formerly Applied Companies, are really the people who sponsor us in this space, and we thank them every day. Uh, and uh, 
you know, the museum is a full-time operation. And, uh, you know, again, our Iron State has really made things really uh, doable, shall we say. Uh, our current exhibit has been up for a while. It's called The Avenue, A History of Washington Street. We feel it's one of our best. It will be coming down December 23rd-ish, or 2nd, December 22nd. Uh, and we will be closing for three or four weeks and setting up the new exhibit. But please come in and check out The Avenue before it comes down. And we will be introducing a virtual version of this exhibit but there's nothing like seeing, uh, shall we say, the reality of the current exhibit. So check that out. And then in our upper gallery, uh, we still, you still can see the artwork of Deborah Paul. She's a Hoboken artist, has a studio in Newman Leather. She, she sort of went into the studio during COVID and produced these wonderful still lifes. And, uh, We've extended that exhibit a bit just to make way for a new exhibit, which needs some fine tuning before it comes our way. And uh, again, if you like this programming, please let us know. Please sign up and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, we get sort of more visitation uh, if you do that. We're not quite up to a thousand uh, uh, subscribers, but we're getting close. And we hope that does happen soon. And again, uh, Hoboken Historical Museum, 1301 Hudson Street. Some people say they don't know where the museum is. It's not that big a town. So get out of the house, get off Netflix, and come visit us. It's a real experience. And I think that is concluding our program. Again, many thanks to Rand Hoppe for uh, producing this, making it happen, and many thanks to Barbara Moriello for appearing on tonight's program. Have a good rest of the evening, and I think we are slowly walking out. <laughs>